Um, my name is Josh Pasteur, and I'm the regional director for CLAC in Kamloops, BC. And um, it's just a real honor to be here today. Um, I was saying to Chief Trevor that I, I asked uh, Chief Roland from West Moberly yesterday um, if he had any suggestions on what I should say um, about Trevor for the introduction. And he said, nah, don't even worry about it. Trevor will talk a lot about himself. So, <laughs> yeah, so I'll leave it at that. I'm going to take that advice, but I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, CLAC is uh, an all-Canadian independent trade union uh, representing over 60,000 workers across the country. And we've been a proud sponsor of the Natural Resources Forum for years. Um, our members here in BC have had a hand in every major infrastructure project that we've been discussing um, uh, this week. They're proud to be building BC and it's an honour to be here on their behalf, advocating for continued access to work and for future projects that will ensure prosperity for all of us. So yeah, I have the, it's an honor to introduce uh, Chief Trevor um, from the Doig River First Nation. And this is particularly uh, special for me when I reflect on the idea of welcoming. Uh, prior to moving to Kamloops, me and my family spent 12 years living and working in Fort St. John. And for our kids, uh, it's been their home. It's where they've grown up. And some of you may have heard of uh, Doig Days. I'm sure many of you have. Uh, each year, the community of Doig River hosts all of the grade four students from the region, um, sharing food, drumming, singing, and just showcasing all the beauty of uh, the culture and their traditions. So last year, it was the turn of our youngest son, Theodore. Uh, he was in grade four, and of course, after seeing his two older siblings experience it, the excitement level in the house was just through the roof. Um, so when he mentioned I was, what I, when I mentioned what I was doing this week, and in particular uh, today, uh, he let me borrow his uh, Doig Day t-shirt from last year. Which was pretty cool, so we took it out of the closet. But he said, Dad, you can't, you can't wear it at the event. You're going to stretch it too much. So I'm, I'm sure probably everyone's probably thankful I didn't wear it anyway. So, yeah. um, so I can't see Trevor. They have, they have him high, waiting in the wings. So thank you, uh, Trevor, and your community for the warm welcome that we've experienced over the years. And it's an honor that... Uh, to um, welcome you back in some small way. So with that, with that, I'd like to ask all of you to join me in welcoming to the stage Chief Trevor McAday. Can everybody hear me? Oh, that's good. Uh, Doig Days, that is, uh, that is an event that's uh, never forgotten, especially if you're in grade four. Um, and you can tell I had to wear my favorite shirt. And uh, I, you can tell who, who picked the color of that shirt for Doig Days. <laughs> um, yeah, I usually, like, I speak straight from the heart. And uh, I usually don't you know, write anything down, but there's so many important things that I do have to say, especially for government and, uh, you know, talking about our relationships and collaboration uh, with our nation and, and, you know, the different industries within our uh, Treaty 8 territory. And there is a lot of uh, chiefs and councils here that uh, are from our, from our part of the world, and we have many different uh, natural resources that uh, get extracted or, you know, pulled from, the from the con our country. And uh, it is important for us to really talk about relationships and collaboration. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just start by uh, reading out. I'd like to recognize Late Late Tanae for whose lands we are meeting on. Thank you for hosting us. I would like, also like to acknowledge our leaders from other nations, local, provincial, and federal governments. I would like to start by telling a little bit about DOIG, my community that I'm very proud to represent today with my council, councillors Brittany, Starr, 
Justin, and I'm proud to work with them. We all strive to achieve consensus decision-making in our governance. We speak with one voice, and that's very important for as a leader. You're only as good as your people, and if you don't share what you're, what's on your mind and get feedback, you never, uh, you'll never get, you'll never, uh, you know, come to some kind of consensus. Uh, it's pretty important for us. A bit of background on DOIG, Treaty 8 First Nation, Northeast BC. We used to be Fort St. John Beaver Band, half of it. And uh, we have experienced oil and gas development since 1952. The first well site that was drilled in our territory was in Boundary Lake, just on, on the Alberta-BC border, east of uh, Fort St. John. Everybody talks about Motney play. Did you know that Motney is named after Chief of Fort St. John Beaver Band? This is how connected we are to the proposed future developments. The Motney gas play is a world-class gas play that needs to be developed sustainably and the balance of economics and environment needs to be for the benefit of our children's children. My early days as the first lands manager in Doig in 1996 was a second-hand elementary school portable donated by School District 60. So I just want you to know that I come from nothing. And, uh, and I was told, Here, here's a job, here's a pile of letters, find your, bu your own budget, we have no money. And uh, then my revenue sharing vision came to, came to light. I started thinking about it back then. Um, we need to use, you know, we used to receive notifications of industrial activity. So basically in our lands, we used to be just notified that something was happening in our backyard. Um, you know, we had no resources, nothing was coming in to, for us to even look at development or even have a say uh, when you couldn't even afford fuel to get there and, uh, you know, put up a fight on it. Uh, from, and the industrial activities were from energy and mines, the letters that we used to get notification for. A lot has changed since then, so has our landscape. Today, we are now focusing on consent-based decision-making. See, I'm not used to reading. <laughs> Usually I have a whole team that uh, you know, notifies me of what I'm going to say. Uh, Consent-based decision-making leads to certainty for natural resources, development in Doiger First Nation territory. We all need certainty for resource development in BC. There are key roles for industry, government, First Nation, and we all must work together in good faith for the benefit of all British Columbians. When development is proposed in our territory, we consider treaty rights as number one, and that's the foundation for us as our forefathers signed that and knew it was something that would sustain our culture and our way of life in the future. And that was the best thing that they could have done for our, for our people in, in Northeast BC for Treaty 8. <clears throat> we consider the treaty rights first, and then the environment, then economic development. After we've, uh, you know, developed a plan with, with, our, with the proponents and, uh, you know, lobbied the government long enough about putting in environmental measures and things like that so we all can live on that landscape after, is uh, something that, you know, our, our, we, we strive for. For DOIG, relationships matter. Going back to treaty and signing of Treaty 8, DOIG doesn't view it as a ceded and surrender treaty, but one of peace and friendship, access to the land base, and sharing the resources together. 
We have worked with BC Energy Regulator to ensure pre-engagement is built into the process of consultation. This is a change for everyone, but industry has key, a key role, role in collaborating with Doigerver through relationship agreements. These relationships are important. Agreements that create certainty for industry to achieve consent to a permit or a project through an effective process. Relationship agreements are not IBAs, but a playbook on how industry and Doiger First Nation will work together. It creates certainty to a process. Doiger relationship agreements ensure pre-engagement, sharing of information, maps, conversation, and our lands office, scheduled meetings, cons consultation, outcomes, consistent with the BCER. Land use planning, our land use plan is almost complete and we're working on that vigorously every day. Uh, cumulative effect tools, we have built our own tool to assess the cumulative effects. Community investment, business development, cross-cultural training and treaty education. Nobody knows your story unless you, you, uh, you put it out there and be truthful about it. We value and appreciate our agreements that make a big impact in our community through community investment to culture, language, health, and education and business development. We brought our ECDEV team here as well, Wujo Developments. Members support Wujo Developments. There is a buy-in because it's for the benefit of all members. In our community, we say hashtag 335. That is the focus of the DOI Council. We do things from the grassroots for the benefit of everyone, not just a few. For a decade, we have been working to improve our administration and generating own source revenue from multiple streams because we do not want to be dependent on the federal government. This includes participating in the natural resource economy and generating our own wealth through commercial development on our urban reserve in Fort St. John. Through our work with local government and business community, we have built a shared understanding and have created a shift from the work against the nation to work with us for prosperity for all in the peace region. Because of this great work with local government, our investment will exceed over $100 million in the cities of Fort St. John and Dawson Creek. We have settled our treaty land entitlement claim and proceeds have and will continue to be invested within North, Northeast BC. We are doing the work today to ensure the benefit for seven generations of our people. Side note, settlements get reinvested in local economy and the provincial coffers. So when, when a claim comes in, it's not just all oh, those Indians, they get a they get a few bucks again. It gets reinvested where we live. We invest in our communities and we invest in our region. Every dollar that I get, I spend it in my local region. <laughs> DOIG also collaborates with other Treaty 8 nations and the province of British Columbia in developing a new fiscal framework that includes revenue sharing, one of my biggest dreams, in 1996. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and uh, that, that includes revenue sharing from natural resource sector. In, in Northeast BC, Treaty 8 territory, we are blessed by the Creator for giving us the natural resource tools for all, for the sustainability for all our peoples including Indigenous, non-Indigenous residents, a fair share needs to come back to our region to support First Nation, local governments for healing the land and healing the people. Local governments understand when we don't have enough nurses or teachers. Our kids get taught in public schools and we need to invest in our people 
And if the resources are coming from our country, then we need our fair share. <laughs> to conclude, it takes a diverse, inclusive community, province, and, na and a nation to create a future where we are experiencing Gema. Gema is a finding a good place in life and in nature. Thank you to the organizers for inviting us to share a bit about Doig and Doig's view on sustainable resource development. Something that we do say a lot, and it's even on our Ujo Development's business cards, is Yidde Tsawawa. Yidde Tsawawa means for the future generations, and we're thinking seven generations ahead. And it's very important. I, I did hear some rumblings earlier about, you know, carbon reducing that. You can reduce it, but, you know, there's only so much infrastructure for electric cars. There's almost, you know, there's a lot of minerals that have to get extracted. Are they thinking about, you know, the fuel that has to get burned for mining and all that stuff? There's a lot of, there's a lot of thinking that has to go on and I think it's the people that have to push it. How do we get there? And how do we find a balance between nature and industry, environment? It's for the future generations, for our kids that are coming. What are we leaving to them? What is our legacy? Thank you. Ten minutes left. <laughs> Thanks, Logan. So we have uh, a lot of questions. I see that have um, showed up on the on our screen, and um, so a big topic of this conference, Chief, has been economic reconciliation. Can you share your vision for economic reconciliation for Doig River First Nation? My vision? I think it's, uh, it's pretty clear. We have to be at the decision-making table when it comes to policies and, and uh, you know, be a part of the solution. That's the only way to be part of it. And, you know, be a part of the economy. There's a lot of roads being built out there. There's you know, all kinds of industries that are happening and it's part, it's, it's part, it's time to be a part of it. I think uh, First Nation community, you know, through partnership with uh, the government, local governments and, you know, the provincial government is a key to it. And the industry is already set a pace. We have relationships, we have you know, meetings constantly with all the proponents, Oventive, Shell, you're up, there's a lot of you here, and you are investing in our community, and I think that's just, you know, participation and, and invitation to be a true player at the table. So, Chief, can you share something you are excited about in 2024 for Doig River First Nation? 2024. There's a lot of things that I'm excited about. Our urban reserve development is, uh, you know, something that's, uh, that's been a long time coming. I think I talked to one of the councillors who is, uh, I won't say the opposition now, Dan Davies. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Davies, he was a city councillor when we did our first MOU in Fort St. John, and that was a big deal. Um, you know, it hasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't really done before, and uh, we really wanted to build a relationship 
with the local municipality, Fort St. John. And uh, I think through that and over the years, 2024 is when we break ground in our urban reserve for our first gas station. Of course, it's a Shell gas station. <laughs> um, you know, they've, they've got some pretty good programs and uh, they're, re they're really collaborative. And it made it easy for us to partner with Shell. Not too many horns. Uh, that's what I'm excited for for 2024, for our people to see their own gas station and, uh, of course, you know, tax-free tax -free gas for them. But you have to have a status card. So you better make some friends out there. <laughs> Question from uh, Emily. Can you speak more about the land use planning and cumulative effects initiatives Doig River is working on and how it may change how industry engages with Doig River? Uh, the biggest thing would be protection areas. In some areas, some of our people use constantly and for it's through our culture, through our, you know, just uses of land and, and how our way of life, living out there. And some things need to be protected. Like we're not saying all the land needs to be protected, but there is, there is some spots there's no go zones. And I think once you understand where it is and why, um, you know, measures can be put in place and we can work together on mapping and planning and we do have we do have working tables with the provincial government right now and we are going through those processes with forestry to land like land use plans and actually getting down to and working together well that's the only that's the only direction i see it has to be done together um it's important that's what the cumulative effects case the blueberry case came about you know, we could not practice our way of life because of industrial activity. When you clear cut a whole forest, there's nothing left there. And that's where this all came about. So something has to be done. There needs to be some, some kind of balance between the environment and industry. Not only oil and gas, there's forestry, mining, everything has, there has to be a balance. And it has to be done together with the people, and um, that's just the only way I see it. Like, there, there has to be plan, plans that everybody knows about. It's not a secret, and it just doesn't roll out and say, oh, this is our new plan. If you don't know about it, and you haven't had any, any say or any input, it, it just won't work. There needs to be input on all sides for there to be a plan. And that's, that's, what, that's how I feel. And I think our council feels the same way. There's a lot of questions keep coming up. Uh, <laughs> I guess I don't have to get creative today. Uh, how has DOIG approached the balance of allocating funds to solving today's pro problems and needs versus investing in economic development and growing our own source revenues to ensure future prosperity? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> Balance. Um, basically, we've invested in our people, and over the last decade, we've encouraged our our members, to, you know, to get educated. There's there's positions out there for you, and we've had to hire a lot of staff. And there's succession plans within our within our our um, organization, and there has to be succession plans. And we're bringing in some of our younger band members and things like that. And giving them, uh, giving them hope. There's, there's, there's jobs for you. Uh, what was the question again? It's a balance. <laughs> it's a balance of how we're investing uh, today and in the future. Oh. Our own source revenue. Yeah, I think we do invest quite a bit into our people. First, you're only as good as your people, and I've always said that. Uh, from there, it's, uh, it's important to make sure that you do invest in, in quality viable projects. And, uh, you know, the research has to be done too. You can't build a gas station if there's only electric cars. <laughs> but 
you know, we... <laughs> And if you look into the future, you do, you do see that, you know, we're going to be dependent on, you know, on fuel and, and other things for, for quite a while. There's not, the infrastructure's not, not there. And uh, when it gets really cold, there's blackouts and stuff right now, and everybody sees it. So let's be realistic and, you know, invest in, in what we need to get done. So this is a really good question, uh, Chief. What advice do you have for proponents that are interested in working with DOIG? Don't bring any donuts. <laughs> um, the biggest thing is relationships. I'm going to say it over and over. It's a relationship. And if you don't have a relationship with somebody, how are you going to get anything done? And that's, that's the biggest thing is, is be there, be present. A letter, a phone call is not going to cut it in a lot of cases. And if, you're, if you put in the time and you put in the effort, your results will be based on those efforts. Get to know your people, get to know the, the nation, get to know the, like what, what, what it means to be to doy for a relationship. That's the biggest thing and be truthful. Honesty, is, honesty goes a long way in Indian country. So we're down to our last minute and 10 seconds. Um, question for you is, uh, I think I'm gonna ask that last one. Um, since most natural resources are in the Northeast, do you have a working agreement with other First Nations who share the same cultural and traditional values? We work. Yeah, Tsekwai, I guess, would be one of the big, one of the, the best examples. It's a, it's a, it's a, basically, it's a, it's a cave that was in um, Chari Lake, BC, and it uh, holds our DNA from, t for, you know, puts us there for 12,500 years. And West Moberly, Prophet River, and Doig River got together and knew this is something important that we have to hang on to. So we purchased the, the lands there, and since we've lobbied industry, government, we've had, we have different, many, many different relationships, uh, you know, to bring archaeology studies, archaeological studies, I should say, and, uh, you know, just educate the locals Bring them in. What? What? Who? Who the Dunza people are from that region, and our culture is there. We have many investments from industry. Oventive is one, and they believe in community investment, and that's that's one big thing. And that we're very proud to have Tsekwa. We just did an Alpha Bull event, and we raised fifty fifty thousand dollars, I think, in one night. And, um, you know, that means a lot to our nations. It's, uh, it means you, you actually care and you want to build a relationship with the local people. And Ovinto is, you know, one of those stars there. Um, they put in the time and effort and it shows. It really does show. And uh, it's a showcase for our culture. Come up and visit Sequa. Uh, we have, you know, all kinds of uh, cultural showcase material there. Everything from arrowheads to I don't want to say I don't even know how to say the the, the jawbone that you know put us on the map for 12,500 years ago. And the information is there. So just come and visit. We have amphitheater there. We have a, we have a Gary Oker biodome. <laughs> I had to say Gary Oker. He's not here to sing tuna yay for you guys, but uh, yeah. Uh, if you come into our country, we have a very, uh, 
articulate cultural master. He's, uh, he, he gets up there and he, he usually does the singing with our kids in uh, Doig days. And uh, Tsuna Ye is Be Kind. Um, we even have you know, some, some songs that we've uh, written in our language for the local kids and they, they sing it as well. It's great. Looks like we're out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Well, Chief Mahakadeh, McCaughey, I almost had it every time. Thank you so much for being here at the BC Natural Resources Forum. I can attest that the relationship building with Chief Trevor did take a number of emails, letters, and many phone calls to get him to uh, accept our offer to speak today. And uh, let's just give him another round of applause. So thank you, thank you so much for your, your insightful words, your leadership, and, and for sharing your story. And, and you know, that's the whole, um, that, that's just very special to our audience. I think it's what makes this conference special. And, and these types of uh, presentations are, are really what people are coming back here every year. So I do have a, a, a small gift for you. Um, and that does conclude our luncheon program for today. So please also join me in thanking Clock for sponsoring this luncheon. And uh, we will move on to our final panel of the day, which really is going to be a, an amazing session as well. So please, if you can stay, please come back to see. Thank you so much.